Welcome to Tools in Action. Uh, in this special afternoon session, we are engaging in conversation with tool developers to talk about impact measurement and management. My name is Armi Temmes from Aalto University in Helsinki, and I'm joined today by Eva Zabe, Director, Ecosystem Evaluation at the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and Doug McNair, Natural Capital Coalition, to discuss the Natural Capital Protocol and Toolkit. The Natural Capital Protocol is a framework for environmental impact assessment that we reviewed as part of the Global Value Project. A showcase is now available online and on the show floor of this virtual event. Warmly welcome, Eva and Doug. Lovely to have you to join me today. For the listeners, I'd love, Eva and Doug, you to introduce yourselves and say a few, few words about your background. Thanks so much, uh, Armi. I'll kick off then. Pleasure to uh, be with everyone online now. Uh, so I'm Eva Zabe. I'm responsible for uh, our work on natural capital and ecosystems, in particular measurement and valuation. And the organization I work for is the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, uh, where I've been for over 12 years. It's an association of about 200 companies that work on sustainability. And Doug, and, please. Yes, I'm Doug McNair. I'm uh, uh, the technical manager for the Natural Capital Coalition on secondment from uh, ERM, where I am a uh, technical director and I specialize in valuation of natural capital and ecosystem services. Okay, thanks a lot. Now we'll get, uh, get to the actual discussion about natural capital protocol and, of course, the first Obvious question is, what is the Natural Capital Protocol? Why was it developed and, and what is the state of implementation at the moment? Sure, uh, I'll take that question. The, the protocol is a framework that was designed to help companies measure and value their impacts and dependencies on natural capital. So it, it's designed specifically to help them in their internal decision making and to help mainstream the use of standard financial and economic tools in their management decision-making process. The protocol was released uh, about a year ago, last July, and there's already been significant uptake and use of the protocol by businesses and sort of as an added benefit, it's also being used by a lot of um, of public agencies as well because they find a lot of value in the, the format and the framework um, in making sure that decisions incorporate natural capital. The reason it was developed was because there were many tools and, and frameworks out there and our goal was to try to harmonize those uh, tools and frameworks so that businesses could really look at this as a, um, a, a single framework that integrates many different approaches, sort of a one-stop shop for them to be able to do a better job of including natural capital in their decision making. I think the major reason why the protocol has done so well and sort of exceeded all of our expectations in the amount of uptake is the way in which it was developed. There were something like uh, close to 40 different organizations that donated time and effort to helping to generate the uh, protocol, and, and that was led by um, Eva and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And over 450 different groups contributed comments as the protocol was developed. Thank you. It's, it's, it's amazing and it's a huge uh, effort of, of many stakeholders. But what actually is natural capital? Natural capital is the stock of biotic and abiotic natural resources that provide value to people through a flow of services. So the goal is to be able to understand um, what those services are and how they contribute to human welfare. So, for example, um, uh, rivers provide water and fish that people 
catch and eat, or you, they use the water for farming or for um, plants, manufacturing plants. So the the natural capital is that stock of water in the river that provides value to people. Um, on which companies are dependent and impact on, yes. I understand. Yeah. Yes. Another um, aspect of why the protocol is doing so well in terms of uptake is that many companies had already understood some of their impacts on nature and, and developed ways of looking at those. But what the protocol has brought home to them is the extent to which they depend on natural capital as well. Companies, for example, are finding that um, wetlands around their facilities uh, provide groundwater that would be expensive to get otherwise or protect against floods um, and storm surge, which again would be uh, much more difficult to reduce the risks in other man-made ways. So it's, a, so it's more than the actual natural resources that the companies take into use, but the different services that they get also from the nature. Yes, that's a good point. So. It is all about the services that provide value to people. It, it's not just the use of, of water. It's not just the use of um, uh, minerals uh, or trees in, in some sort of uh, production process. It's all of the different things that nature provides, which companies hadn't really uh, had the opportunity to think about before and, and mm -hmm. recognize what that value is. Yeah, and where there's not always a proper price tag on them. Some of them do That's have correct. a price tag, but some don't. Yeah, okay. Right. Um, my next question would be very practical. Uh, when you start this, because this really sign, sounds like something that companies should be aware of, what, what would you actually do in such an assessment using the natural capital framework? The protocol has four major stages and then within each of those stages there are a number of steps so there's a total of nine steps altogether and the, the major stages are framing scoping measuring and valuing and then applying the protocol the first step really is to think through um, what it is that you want to measure and why you want to measure it why is it important to the company? So that's sort of the, the first stage of the process is answering the question of um, why you want to conduct this natural capital assessment. And, and a lot of different companies answer that question in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, some companies really want to focus on a specific project or a specific uh, use of, of the uh, protocol whereas other companies want to do it more broadly on a corporate-wide basis to, to get a flavor of where the protocol can provide the most value going forward. So that first, first um, step is all about trying to understand why you should do it and where is it going to provide the most value to the company. Uh, so, so it means like sort of a, from a point of view of a researcher, you put up a research question. It could be helpful at this point to think about, you know, the research question in, in an academic setting would is the equivalent to, in this kind of situation, is what we call in the protocol a type of uh, decision, which is which are called business applications. And uh, we outline five types of ways you would use the protocol. So the first is, do you want to assess the risks and opportunities to your business? So that is quite an overarching application, but it's one that many companies will start with because they'll want to understand what are those risks and opportunities. The second is to use the protocol to compare options. For example, I don't know, maybe what procurement sourcing option has the lowest natural capital risk or which companies or assets should your portfolio favor or exclude. It's a decision you're comparing two options. The third kind of decision is when you assess the impacts on stakeholders. Uh, for example, uh, do compensation claims for a recent incident 
accurately reflect the natural capital values for, of the affected stakeholders. So uh, some companies face that uh, and need to understand what is the impact on stakeholders. The fourth kind of example could be um, when you want to estimate the total value and or net impact. So we hear more and more companies that want to be net positive or understand their net, in, net impact. And that is basically, for example, are you getting the highest and best use of your property or your land from a total value point of view? And then the fifth type of decision is uh, to communicate internally or externally. So you may be doing this, for example, for marketing or uh, reporting and disclosure to external stakeholders. So it's important to understand what kind of decision you're trying to um, inform by using yeah. the protocol. Okay, that's very important. So, so when starting with a protocol, you you first need to define what you want to do, and 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 set set the objectives. Or what, uh, what would you do then, in practice, when you go forward with the with the assessment? If we go step by step through the the practical things sure. that you do to to somehow sort of visualize what the tool is about, because it's so broad and so interesting. Well, you know, part of the value of the protocol is helping companies think through in a systematic way how to approach natural capital issues. And a lot of companies are finding that the process itself um, is beneficial because of that thoughtfulness that arises because of going through the process. So sort of the next general step after defining what the objective of the assessment might be is determining what the scope of the assessment would be. The biggest one to decide in terms of scope is are you going to look at this from the point of view of the company, the value of some impacts and dependencies to the company itself, or are you going to take a broader view and look at the impacts on society as well? So that that is one key issue that that comes next in scoping the assessment. That that scope also includes understanding whether, you know, what time frame you're going to do this over. Um, are you going to be looking at what's happening in the next few years or over a longer time period? Are you going to consider what happens uh, spatially at uh, just near your facility, the places where you have actual impacts? Are you going to go broader out into the community? Um, a lot of it has to do in, in determining the scope, whether you're, which of the five um, topics that Eva mentioned that you're going to do. When I reviewed it, I felt that it's a, it's a sort of mapping exercise. Then setting setting a map of the of the impacts. We've gone through the first step of, you know, why should you even conduct an actual capital assessment? We've been through step two uh, and step three, which is the next uh, steps in the scope phase as we scope the assessment. Um, and this is also, you know, for step three, it's what's the appropriate scope? So are you looking at corporate level or just a product? Uh, are you looking at your direct operations or through your supply chains? All of these uh, aspects which are very important. And then you're right, the fourth uh, step four, which is the last step of our scope stage, really identifies you know, which impacts and or dependencies are material. So this is basically a, a materiality assessment to prioritize which are the ones that should be measured and valued as you enter then the next stage, the measure and value stage. So this may be, for example, okay, we've identified that water consumption in the supply chain is uh, a high material uh, impact that we need to look at. And maybe, you know, our dependency on pollination is also a very material dependency for us to consider and really assess in the next st st stage and step. So, and then we can go on to the stage called measure and value, which also consists of three steps, uh, steps five, six, and seven. And that's all about um, really starting to put some uh, metrics and estimate extent and kind of the we move into the valuation uh, per se, which is starting to say, well, how important, um, what is the worth, how useful 
are these impacts and dependencies. And that's where it can be monetary valuation, but it doesn't have to be. It can be qualitative, quantitative, or monetary. Uh, and then finally, the apply stage consists of two steps, which are really important because they really help answer, you know, how can you interpret, validate, and verify your assessment process and results? Um, and this is where the user then really I, considers the quality of the results, the assumptions, are they acceptable? Are they sufficient for me to make this decision? Um, are they robust enough to proceed? And then finally, the ninth step is really about how you apply your results. Uh, so how do you act on them? But then also we think it's important to include, and we included, how do you integrate natural capital into existing processes such as environmental management systems and, and the like? Because it, the fact of valuing natural capital provides an additional lens to the information that a company has that can be much more insightful than stopping at measurement. So, for example, if you just look at how, uh, you know, how many cubic meters of water you've consumed, that's one piece of information. But, of course, the whole context of whether that's in a water-stressed area or not, who are the other users of that water, all of that can be reflected in the value of water. And so the company will get a much better insight into how, uh, into the risks and opportunities linked to their water consumption, for example. Um, so it's really, uh, we think, uh, a way of helping make much better decisions, ultimately. We're back to decision-making. Oh, thanks a lot, Eva. I, it, it sounds sort of really going into the impact side of, of, uh, of company action, which is of interest to our project. But this sounded like a sort of huge effort. How long would you think that this kind of assessment takes and, and what kind of skills are needed? I hate to answer like this, but it all depends um, on what you're trying to achieve as to how much effort and what kind of skill set that you ultimately need. Um, one can, can do this at a screening level to really help companies get their arms around specific issues. In, in which case it can be done uh, relatively quickly. And, and I think numerous companies that helped pilot test the protocol actually were able to complete them in uh, a month or two uh, just because of the, the time that they had to do it. And they still got a lot of value out of that process. Um, others where it's a more detailed analysis of specific projects. Let's say it might be a capital expenditure project and you're trying to, to decide the um, specific location um, and attributes of the facility. Uh, that could require much more in-depth information, maybe some primary data collections as well, in, in which case it could take longer, six months uh, to a year to complete. Um, so it all depends on the specific application. I think that the skills that are needed, I, I guess I would put them into two broad categories. Uh, one is technical skills that surround the um, particular resources that you're, you're using. So you might need, obviously, people with experience um, and background in, in water management if uh, the primary issue is water uh, resource management. You might need people with backgrounds in uh, forestry and biodiversity. Uh, might need ecologists uh, involved as well. So there's that sort of technical science side is one broad set of skills that you would need. And I think the other the other set could be environmental economics or economic skills. If the issue becomes monetary uh, valuation because mm -hmm. they they can help sort through uh, the appropriate way of computing those monetary values when they're outside of the kind of monetary values the company is used to um, computing. I, I agree completely with Doug in the sense that, you know, it's a difficult question because it depends. And in a way, what we're asking is not how, what are the resources needed to use the natural capital protocol? In fact, it's a question of what are the resources needed to carry out a natural capital assessment, uh, basically. 
And so um, I think in, in some, of, some, of our, some of the pilot testers estimated that they spent about, and this is a big ballpark, but just to get a number out there, possibly 50,000 US dollars on consulting services for their assessments over a six month period. So that's a relatively defined, but still a pretty significant piece of work. Um, some companies spend much less, others spend more, of course, as Doug said, it depends on the resources and skills you have in-house already. But what's interesting is to know that some companies um, have really invested significantly more and that's really for an in-depth assessment that contributes to their multi-year strategic ambition. So for companies that are really seeing this as, okay, we need to completely rethink our business, then obviously from the senior management, top of the company, CEO level, they are saying we're going to invest in this assessment because it's going to shape our whole business moving forward. So there is a, there is a big range, um, but of course to get those skills you do need to... Um, you, need, you do need some resources if you don't have them in-house. Sure, and um, even if they are in-house, they are resources. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and so, so, so it means that, that uh, anyway, car really carrying out the protocol assessment would be a, would be a combined effort of in-house resources and consultant services because the needed skills obviously are pretty broad. So if you have a limited, a limited budget and you want to do a back of the envelope, just high level assessment, then you can do that too. Of course, the results will be what they are. I mean, that's uh, the resources. Yeah, but you can, it might be sufficient for the decision you're trying to make. Okay. So, so uh, thorough assessment always requires resources and that's, that's quite true. And uh, perhaps in the interest of time, we'll, we'll jump a little bit to the toolkit. Now we've used the word protocol and framework for the natural capital protocol because it, it is a guidebook that you can upload from or download actually. But now there's a project going on sort of preparing a toolkit for this. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Sure, absolutely, and it's great that uh, WBCSD is uh, collaborating with the Natural Capital Coalition on this one too. And the background is basically that the protocol, as we've talked about, is this overall framework, uh, and it does not prescribe any specific tools or methodologies or approaches uh, intentionally because it needs to be flexible in its use, and it needs to be generally accepted and very credible. It also needs to remain up to date. So as soon as you add one tool, we know that then there are new tools that um, are developed all the time. So uh, the next step in our journey is to get a map out the different tools that exist to help users carry out a natural capital assessment. So for example, um, a company may be using the protocol to value water-related risks well, the protocol provides that framework of the steps to go through, but the toolkit can provide information on which existing tools could actually help that user value water. That's uh, what the toolkit is. It's actually currently already available online in its uh, pilot version. So it was out for pilot testing for a month, and we got a lot of, quite a bit of feedback, and now we're improving it. And the official launch of the toolkit will be on the 13th of July, exactly one year day-to-day -day from the launch of the protocol. So we're really excited, excited that uh, the Natural Capital Protocol Toolkit will be officially launched on the 13th of July, which will be exactly one year day-to-day -day since the launch of the protocol. So it also demonstrates that we're continuing to progress on this journey. Wonderful. Sounds, sounds exciting. Can you give some examples of, of the tools in the toolkit? Uh, what kind of um, tools would be and which step of the assessment were, would they come in, in in the protocol? Absolutely. So actually the tools can help on all, any of the nine steps of the protocol. And we've uh, classified them according to the different impact drivers and dependencies that are illustrated in the protocol itself. So there will be tools like uh, the um, 
global water tool or also what's exciting is we have some broader valuation tools. Uh, one of them is actually from PwC. Um, when we developed the protocol, we reached out not only to publicly available tool developers and methodology developers, but we also tried to as access some of the proprietary methodologies that were being developed, and we had an independent review panel that reviewed these. And it was a it was a bit of a hard process because it is hard to get people to open up and, and share what they've been working on behind the scenes. But uh, one illustration is uh, the PwC's methodology to value environmental impacts uh, at a corporate level is now actually part of the toolkit, they've made it that publicly available. So there's a range of tools in the toolkit um, from specific issues to then a whole wide range and you can find them by clicking which filters you're most interested in. Okay, sounds sounds very interesting. Can you can you give a range how many tools are there in the toolkit? Just to give an idea. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> so, so for now, there are about uh, there are just over forty tools, and um, there are more in the pipeline. And we, it's we really would welcome everyone on the line to add tools that uh, you know uh, that, that are available. So there are three criteria to submit a tool onto our toolkit. Um, the first is that it needs to be applicable to the protocol, which is pretty straightforward because it means any kind of natural capital assessment. Uh, the second is that it needs to be applicable to business. Even if business wasn't the initial intended audience for the tool, you need to be able to use it in a business context. Um, and then thirdly, it needs to be publicly available, meaning um, it's not proprietary tools. You need to be able to access the tool, even if there is a fee, that's fine, but it's not, it, it excludes tools that you can only use with a consultant, for example, but that without that you can't access the tool. Sounds very interesting. Interesting, sort of in, in July, we'll, we'll need to, we'll need to uh, go and go and check. And, uh, Thinking that we probably have soon used our time, I would like you to end a little bit with a with a future evaluation. What is the longer term ambition with a toolkit? So this is a it's a really exciting moment. Uh, I think that we're all living um, <laughs> around essentially on our journey to measure value and report on companies' non-financial as well as financial impact. And basically what we need to get to is where companies compete on performance and not on methodology. So in order to get to that, we need methodologies to be more prescriptive, generally accepted. We need the coefficients and values and assumptions to be aligned. And that means that through the toolkit over the years, our ambition is to gather, to gather analytics on users' preferences and users' uh, use of the different tools. So that, for example, maybe in a few years' time, we can say, oh, it seems like 80% of business users use this specific tool to value water in this context. Can we say that that is the way to value water in that context? In which case, we would start to be able to compare results. So we're moving from the comparable process that the protocol is with the comparable steps, the logical step-by-step -step process, to then getting to comparable results. And that's when the companies that are more sustainable and that are managing natural as well as social capital in a more sustainable way alongside financial capital, they're the ones that will then be able to be rewarded. Um, right now, there isn't a mechanism to be able to compare companies in that way. So we really see it as a part of a much bigger journey that we're on towards true cost, true value and true profit in corporate decision making and reporting. Okay, thank you very much Eva Zabay and, and, and Doug McNair for, for this discussion on, on natural capital protocol and really I agree that we are living in uh, exciting times when 
we hope for for getting to a situation where the companies really are accountable and 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 feel responsible for their impacts to to the whole global nature thank you very much thanks very much thank you